Anytime someone comes to you uh, desiring perhaps um, to learn about um, how to train better, and they have health objectives, and they want to be more fit or healthy, if you're in the position of providing an assessment and putting together a training program for someone, or you just want to know more about it, I'm going to go over some of the objectives that are critical for that process. So first of all, what you need to do is establish a baseline. Where is someone right now before you start talking about where do you want to go and how are we going to get you there? So the first thing you do in a fitness assessment uh, is before establishing the objectives, when you do the assessment, you need to look at the following five things. And the first thing you need to look at is their heart and lung efficiency, their cardiorespiratory efficiency. You need to know that once again to find out where they are right now. Establish that baseline before you move on. Second, you need to know about their dynamic movement or their posture. Um, where are they there? Where do they want to be? Three, you need to go over their physiology, get their heart rate, their blood pressure, resting, and then perhaps with moderate exertion, just to get an idea of the range there as well. You want to make sure you assess them for their fat and muscle composition, get their body mass index, uh, their waist to hip ratios, things like this. So once again, establishing where they are now as to their fat and muscle, how much fat, percentage body fat, how much muscle um, composition, uh, get them on the BMI and things like that. And then finally, their athletic ability. And here you might just want to check a baseline. What are they able to do with bench press, um, squat assessment, this sort of thing. Once again, all of this just to establish this is their level of health right now. This is their level of fitness right now. This is where they are as a baseline. This is what they're capable of. Uh, you don't want to take someone without doing any sort of assessment and say, let's go run five miles if they're not capable of achieving that because uh, of these issues here. So you begin a fitness assessment uh, with their cardiorespiratory efficiency, their posture, heart rate, blood pressure, BMI, waist to hip ratio, bench press and squat, and you collate all that together to get a snapshot or a picture of what someone's capable of. From there, you can then establish a fitness program. Um, it allows you to compare as you move along Okay, this is where they were, this is where we are now as you're going along to assess progress and also to see how effective the program was. So for uh, effectiveness and for measuring progress for a particular regimen, you've got to have this beginning information. So before you get started uh, recommending anything, get the baseline and then work from there. If you'd like to know more about this and things related to it, um, beneath this video there's a link. Click on it. It'll take you to a website with that information. Also on that website, you'll find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. All right, uh, today we're going to talk about how to find percentage body fat. And this is done using calipers in millimeters, measuring uh, skin folds, pinches of skin, skin folds at four different areas. Uh, it begins with a vertical pinch of skin on top of the bicep, about halfway between the elbow and the shoulder. The second place then is on the tricep, on the back of the arm, a vertical pinch or fold of skin, once again halfway between the shoulder and the elbow. Uh, those two are measured in millimeters. And then you go to the person's back, about two centimeters uh, below their scapula, their shoulder blade, and there you're going to pinch a fold of skin at a 45 degree angle and measure that. And then finally the last place you're going to go is uh, the iliac crest or basically the pelvis at the top just above that at a 45 degree angle with the top of that 45 degree angle going towards the person's armpit. Once you have the uh, measurements then from each of these four places vertical pinch at the bicep, vertical pinch at the tricep, 45 degree at the uh, subscapular and 45 degree just above the iliac crest you take those four measurements together and you put them in the proper formula and that will churn out for you the percentage body fat. This particular method uh, works well for those between the ages of uh, 17 and about 65. Today we're going to take a little bit of time to talk about several methods or ways that you can help people reduce the amount of fat eaten in their diet. How to reduce the amount of fat that is consumed in a person's diet. I've got seven uh, ways uh, on the board here behind me. Obviously this does not exhaust the topic, but just to give us a basic overview and to talk about things that you can do, not only for yourself, but to help others reduce the amount of fat eaten in their diet. So the first one 
Uh, we talk about the importance of nutritional labels, the importance of nutritional labels. Uh, the government requires nutritional labels on food to talk about the amount of fat in that particular product. And so uh, in educating someone on how to reduce the amount of fat in their diet, you need to teach them how to read a nutritional label and say, always look at the back before you buy the product. And if you're going to consume it, um, obviously you can't do this for restaurants, um, although actually some restaurants do print uh, fat content for various things that you order off the menu, especially fast food places. Uh, but essentially, when they're buying their own food and looking at these things, you tell them to look at the nutritional label, see the amount of fat uh, per serving, um, do the simple calculations to figure out how much would be consumed in your average serving, and realize that the goal then is that less of their daily caloric intake, uh, less than 30% of it should be from fat. So less than 30% of the daily calories consumed need to be from fat. So you're trying to get their calorie fat consumption less than 30%. So nutritional labels are key to that. Number two, encourage them to eat more fish and chicken and less red meat. So um, if they can make a, a, a swap, if you will, okay, you might want a hamburger here, instead have the chicken sandwich. Uh, you want a steak, why not have the fish? So encourage them to make these swaps and eat more fish and chicken and less red meat. Third, encourage them to eat more vegetables and less meat. So we've already made the meat swap, and then from there, increase vegetables, decrease the amount of meat eaten per day, per, per meal. Perhaps if you can get a salad in without chicken on it uh, and not too much dressing, you reduce the amount of fat and uh, the calories coming in are more healthy. So uh, that helps with eating more vegetables, less meat. Number four, encourage them to eat smaller portions. Sometimes uh, someone wants to eat something that they really like, it's got high fat content, tell them that's okay, just eat less. You don't have to fill up on this or eat a huge amount. Uh, choose smaller portions, and if they were to do this not just on the, the time that they feel like they're cheating, you know, eating something that's uh, higher in fat, but for all they're eating, to lessen the portions that they're eating. Eat less portions per meal, reduces the amount of calories coming in overall, and certainly reduces the amount of calories coming in from fat. So eat smaller portions. And then five, when they're given the choice between saturated fats, trans fats, and unsaturated fats, to always choose the unsaturated fats. So once again, the nutrition labels are key here, but eat unsaturated fats and try to avoid saturated fats and trans fats. Between saturated and trans, trans fats are obviously the worst. Um, so stay away from the trans fats altogether if you're able to. Saturated fats, keep them to a minimum and uh, prioritize if you are going to have fats, unsaturated fats. And then six in food preparation, encourage them to not fry the food or for yourself. I want to lo uh, lower my amount of fat uh, consumed so when I'm going to prepare my food or I'm going to have my food prepared by another or I'm telling someone else about food preparation, don't fry the food. You're frying it in fat, which of course adds to the fat content of the food. Uh, find other ways that are just as tasty to prepare the food without frying it. And then finally, number seven, eat less snack foods. Now, we're not saying snack less, we're eating less snack type foods. Snack type foods are gonna be like potato chips and uh, cookies and things like that that obviously are going to be high in the fat content. If you need a snack, eat an apple, have some carrots, things like this. So snacking is okay, but when you're snacking, more vegetables, less snack type foods that are high in fat, usually saturated and trans fats. These are just some of the ways that you, in educating someone else or for yourself, can encourage less fat intake in the diet and thereby improve health. Um, there are obviously more things that can be said under this way, but there are seven ways to reduce fat in a person's diet. Nutrition labels, key. Information, you need that information. Nutrition labels, eat more fish, less red meat, uh, more chicken, less red meat, eat more vegetables, less meat, smaller portions, unsaturated fats, don't fry your food, and try to minimize and or get rid of the snack foods. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to that website. And while you're at that website, you'll find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. When uh, people think about weight loss, it's something that's on the mind of quite a few people and uh, they want to know what are the strategies, what can I do, what should I do, what should I not do. Uh, the following are just a few suggestions that can help you if you're in the um, place of wanting to offer advice to someone who's wanting to lose weight. 
uh, if they ask you, what can I specifically do? Now, most people uh, want to hear, I can take a pill and look like a weightlifter or a, a supermodel. And that's just not realistic, nor is it healthy. And the goal ought to be long-term health, not just short-term weight loss. So in terms of long-term health, we're going to go over some things here that you can use as suggestions to help people who want to be healthier and who want to lose weight. The first one and the most important one is that diet plus exercise is still the best way to promote long-term health and to lose weight. People don't like to hear that, but it's fact. It's reality. If you exercise to get your body healthy and you eat less than you use, you will lose weight, you will be more healthy. So diet and exercise are critical to people's health and to weight loss. And you have to get them over that hurdle. You got to let them know that, hey, the diet isn't extreme, nor do we want to make you lose a rapid amount of weight instantly. It's going to be over the long haul as your health improves and as your diet improves, your weight will go down. So diet and exercise still the best way to help people lose weight. Next. Get them to make changes, even small changes, but whatever changes they make, make sure they are changes for long-term health, not short-term weight loss. If they go on a particular diet that promises to help them lose 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 pounds, and it's just a short-term change, all of that weight will come right back. And it may even add more, which of course psychologically discourages the person and does not improve their health. Yo-yoing the body like that up and down is not helpful. So help them make small incremental changes with always the goal beyond just the immediate weight loss to long-term health. So convince them that diet and exercise is important or critical and then just making changes that always have the idea of long-term health in view. I am making a lifestyle choice here, not just a short-term temporary change so I can shed a few pounds. Next, help them do something measurable. Help them burn in a measurable way 500 more calories a day than they consume. So. If they're on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, help them burn 2,500 calories so that there's a, a point at which they are burning more than they are consuming and therefore each day they're losing a little bit more weight. So um, 500, use 500 more calories than you actually consume each day. Four, beware of setting a perfect weight goal. This is very dangerous because once again, it's not long-term health. I'm not making a lifestyle change. I'm just driving myself to get to this magic number, whatever that is. And once I get there, then I can quit all the changes I've made and go back to the way things were before because I've reached the magic number. There is no perfect weight. I mean, I know we've got um, body mass indexes, uh, indices, and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not body mass and, and weight, it's, it's health. So um, try to keep out of their mind these ideas of, I've got to get down to this weight. It's like, no, you need to make small incremental changes to get healthy and the weight will slowly come off over time. Next, give them as much education as possible and by one looking at their life and then comparing it to a healthy lifestyle. So eating patterns, when do you eat? Why do you eat then? Do you plan, uh, traditionally snack a lot before going to bed? Why is that? When you go through the grocery store, do you go well fed or hungry? Makes a difference on the choices you make or the restaurants you visit. So, in one sense, you need to give them good education about their eating patterns and about shopping patterns. When you go, why you go, do you graze while you shop, do you try all the samples, things like this, just to make little changes. Eat, then go shopping. You're less likely to snack as you go, less likely to buy things that are really poor for your health. So education on eating patterns, their eating patterns as compared to healthy eating patterns, their shopping patterns as compared to healthy shopping patterns. Next, talk to them about portion control. It's not that you're eating pizza, it's that you're eating a whole pizza. A slice or two of pizza is not bad, but an entire pizza is a problem. So talk to them about portion control. You can have what you want, just to keep it smaller. And then next, have them keep a log of their food so that you can get a snapshot of a day, a week, and maybe even a month. Here is how you ate, when you ate, how much you ate, um, perhaps even have them include things about their mental and emotional state. I was bored and so I snacked. I was depressed and so I ate comfort food. Things like this. I was stressed so I went and grabbed a Twinkie. You know, and, and don't berate them for that. Just keep the log and get a snapshot of 
when they eat, why they eat, and uh, how much they eat so that you can help them make small changes, once again, for long-term health. And then last, let them know that occasional cheating is okay. We're not trying to drive them into the ground or make them miserable, but that the long haul, the overall path that they are on is a healthy one. If your trajectory is healthy, the occasional extra cookie is not gonna derail it. We can get back on track, it's not a problem. So occasional cheating is okay. Well, this is just a smattering of ideas, weight loss suggestions that can help people who are seeking to lose weight. If you'd like to learn more about this and related matters, there's a link underneath this video. Click on it, it'll take you to a website. And at that website, along with that other information, you'll also find there a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. We are going to talk about the actions of muscles. The main actions that muscles take are isometric, isokinetic, and isotonic. Isometric action is a stable, unmoving action of the muscle. It is a static exercise, meaning the muscle and the joint does not move and the muscle does not change length. Isometric exercise can strengthen the muscle, but only in the position that the exercise was held. Isokinetic exercises require um, a machine. It's a motion that's made on a machine that controls the speed and the force of the movement. Isotonic or dynamic action moves the muscle visibly. It is a motion um, most often associated with standard muscle training. It can be broken down into two phases. The concentric phase, which is the positive contraction, uh, which is usually the lifting action. It uh, is working against resistance, and this causes a shortening of the muscle. The eccentric phase is the negative contraction, which causes the lengthening. It is typically the extension phase of the exercise. So the muscles can perform isometric or static exercise, isokinetic action, requiring a machine to control the speed and the force of the movement, or isotonic, which is the actual movement of the muscle and joint, uh, typically referred to in standard muscle training. Today we're just going to go over uh, just a few of the uh, basic facts related to skill fitness. How you can tell what level someone has in a particular skill, how fit they are. And it, it can be broken down into six categories and just want to briefly go over those categories so that uh, as you're thinking about skill fitness you'll know what to be looking for. So first when we think about someone's skill fitness level we need to think about agility. agility. Agility is the ability to change body position rapidly and to maintain uh, control over your body movements. Someone who has high agility can rapidly change body position and has a high degree of control over their body's motion or movements. When we think of agility, we tend to think of people like gymnasts, these sorts of things. They have a high degree of control over their body movements as well as the ability to change their body position rapidly. Along with agility, we have balance, and this is the ability to stay upright while moving or standing. And once again, we might think of a gymnast on a balance beam here. Their ability to remain balanced, to stay upright while moving or standing. Uh, after balance, we have coordination, and coordination has to do with the uh, relatedness or connectedness between what the sense information coming in from the eyes or the ears or other senses as it relates to the body's movement. And we talk about good hand-eye coordination, uh, good foot-eye coordination. So a soccer player uh, would obviously need good foot-eye coordination. As the ball is coming in, they have to coordinate body movement to meet the ball with the feet and send it where they want it to go. Uh, same with perhaps a baseball player with good hand-eye coordination looking to hit a pitch as it comes in. The eye is receiving the information and they're able to coordinate body movement related to that sensory information that's coming in. Next, power. Uh, someone's skill fitness is related to their strength plus their speed. Strength uh, plus speed is the uh, way we come up with power. Uh, someone can be fast and not very powerful. They can also be strong and not necessarily 
powerful, but strength plus speed equals power. Um, when we think about this, you might think about what's necessary in terms of a baseball player hitting a home run. They need to be strong and fast in order to connect with the pitch that's coming in and send it over the fence. Next, we think reaction time. Reaction time is the length of time between uh, when the signal is given, whatever that is, visual or uh, audible, and how long it takes the men to respond to that stimulus, that external um, mechanism that says, hey, start. So the reaction time then is the start time after the signal's received. Here you can think maybe of uh, a sprinter down uh, waiting for the sound of the a signal gun to go off and then to immediately after that sound leap from the line and sprint down the lane. So start time is the amount of time it takes from uh, when they hear the signal to the body's beginning motion. And then finally speed. Remember we said power is strength plus speed. Speed is the ability to perform a motion or to cover a distance in a very short, spirit, uh, short period of time, short span of time. Um, the motion uh, speed, we might think here of a boxer's ability to throw a quick punch or jab and then covering distance in a short time span would once again be the, the sprinter or the football player uh, getting his time on his uh, 40 and that sort of thing. So speed is the ability to perform a motion or to cover distance in a short time span. Well anyway, these are the six skill fitness categories, agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed, and where you fall in all these categories would be the level uh, of your skill fitness. And of course, as you evaluate this, you can find areas perhaps where there's uh, areas to improve, weaknesses, and then you can focus on that particular category of skill fitness and try to improve their hand-eye coordination, their balance, their agility, um, their speed, things like this as you put together a training regimen for someone else or for yourself. This has been a, just a brief overview then of skill fitness and the six areas related to it. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll find a link. If you'll click on it, it'll take you to the website with that information. And while you're there, you'll find a link on that website to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today we want to briefly go over assisting touch, how touch can help in therapy and helping others, specific touches and holds to um, teach and instruct people as you're seeking to help them. So I'm just going to go over these that I've got here on the board briefly. When we think about a maintained touch, this is a touch that is used to help a person. Uh, you're using your hand, either holding their hand or uh, touching an appropriate place of their body to help them maintain or hold a position. It's called maintained touch. So at that point, you're using your hand on their hand or on an appropriate body part to say, hold this position, don't move. A palpation touch is a soft touch of your fingertips usually showing which muscle group is being worked. Um, it's gentle and uh, not um, forceful or direct, but sort of a gentle touch showing, hey, this is the muscle group that's being worked here. The knife edge touch has to do with this edge of your hand here as you drag it down a particular uh, muscle group of the body showing which way the um, muscle is contracting. So you're trying to educate and teach and you use the edge of your hand saying the muscle contract this way or that way. And then finally, when we talk about assisting touch, there's the move away and move towards touch, which has to do with uh, getting the person to retreat from, that's the move away, or move in the direction of your hand. Uh, so once again, touch can be uh, a great assistant for you in helping people, in education, in therapy, in uh, rehabilitation, in all those ways. So the maintain touch, hand on hand, hand to appropriate body part, hold this position, don't move, the palpation, uh, soft, gentle touch, uh, appropriately on the muscle group showing which muscles being worked. The knife edge of the hand draw, uh, dragged along the part where the muscle is uh, contracting to illustrate where that's happening and then move away and move towards touch or hand gesture related to letting the person know to move away from, retreat from, or move in the direction of uh, your hand. So this has just been a brief overview of various types of assistive touch. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information, and while you're at that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Hi, today we're going to talk a little bit about circuit training. 
Circuit training is a type of training that links together a series of exercises between four to ten different exercises and introduces a short rest, a brief rest, in between each exercise as they're all done in a circuit. Now, circuit training um, is good for uh, muscle endurance, muscle strength, and cardiovascular fitness. It combines all of these together, uh, which makes it a great way to train. You get uh, maximum benefit, overall body fitness, because you've linked together these four to ten exercises with brief rest, high intensity, and it builds power, strength, endurance, and because it's done rapidly with brief periods of rest between uh, cardiovascular health as well. So one of its greatest positive benefits of circuit training is its versatility. It can be uh, shaped or put together to emphasize uh, one type of benefit over another. For example, uh, a power-based circuit would basically emphasize short time periods of doing the exercise, longer rests between exercises, but once again done with high intensity. So short duration of the exercise, longer rest periods, high intensity, you build power. If you want to do an endurance based a circuit, then what you would do is have longer time periods of engaging in the exercise, shorter rest periods in between, but the same high intensity. And the high intensity is what makes the circuit training beneficial. So uh, it's versatile. It can be tweaked or shaped to either build power or endurance. It promotes overall health, muscle endurance, uh, muscle strength and cardiovascular fitness. And it's linking together in a series uh, between four and ten different exercises usually involving uh, the whole body or large muscle groups in the body. If you'd like to learn more about circuit training and things related to it, there's a link beneath this video. Click on it, it'll take you to a website where you can find out more and at that website you'll also find an ebook ready for immediate download. Today I want to go over briefly dehydration dehydration causes, signs, uh, best way to test for it, and um, best treatment options in terms of dehydration. Uh, I don't personally wish dehydration on anyone. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but it is not pleasant. Uh, last year, prior to Thanksgiving, I got violently ill and was unable to keep any fluids down of, of any kind. My body stopped taking in fluids. They went in, they immediately came back out. And eventually, because of the lack of intake of fluid, my kidneys shut down. I ended up in the hospital. Uh, it was very painful, not a pleasant experience. So dehydration is a bad thing. Um, you don't want to experience it. But what we talk about dehydration, we, the main cause is, of course, lack of water intake or excessive loss of water or high solute load. In my case, I had both of those, a uh, lack of fluid intake and an excessive loss of fluid because I was sick. And uh, this can be especially dangerous in children um, if they become violently ill and they have vomiting or diarrhea. Uh, you can lose a great deal of fluid in a very short amount of time. So anyway, dehydration, lack of water intake, excessive loss of water, uh, it comes about due to sickness, it can come about because someone doesn't drink enough water and then they sweat a great deal, or because of their diet and other things they have a high level of solute in their blood, a high level of things dissolved in it of uh, various types. And this can cause dehydration as the fluids get all out of balance. Signs that someone has dehydration uh, include fever, sweating, hyperventilation, rapid weight loss, decreased urine output, and in my case last year, zero output. Um, the kidneys just shut down. Poor skin turgor. Uh, skin turgor basically is if you pull up the skin on the back of your hand, or behind the arm, you pull it up, tent it up, and let go. If you have good turgor, it goes back to its original place rapidly. If it goes back to its original position slowly, this is poor skin turgor. So dehydration, uh, poor skin turgor tends to be a sign of that. And then increase in the solutes. Uh, things like uh, serum uric acid lab values uh, go up and those sorts of things. Anyway, uh, the best lab assessment for dehydration is to test for uh, serum sodium. Now, normal level is 136 to 145. If it's outside of that, then you have a strong case for dehydration. Uh, the best treatment for dehydration, the best way to rehydrate the body, is to take water orally by mouth or to put a 5% dextrose solution in the water. Uh, in my case, my body was unable to process it, and so it had to go in intravenously. But the best way to treat dehydration is drink lots of water. 
So this has just been a basic overview of dehydration, its causes, its signs, best lab assessment, best treatment. And if you'd like to learn more about this and related matters, underneath this video, you'll find a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has that information. And while you're on that website, you should also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download.